You're listening to the Small Business Talk podcast with Kathy Smith, episode 47. Small Business Talk is a podcast for business owners and entrepreneurs who want a better way to run their businesses without spending years doing it the hard way. Small Business Talk is hosted by Kathy Smith, who has run the same marketing agency for more than 17 years and helped hundreds of business owners achieve their marketing goals. I'm so glad you could join me. Today, our guest is Justine Beauregard. Welcome, Justine. Thank you so much. It's great to be here. And Justine is from Growth Mindset Marketers. So today we're going to talk about how to grow your business without burning out. Where should we start, Justine? Well, I think the key in growing any business, small, medium, or large, is really simplifying your marketing strategies because a lot of people feel overextended and that's easy to lead to a burnout. The best way to think about it is to really scale back on your marketing efforts and take a real close look at what are the activities and the actions that I'm taking every single day that are actually resulting in something that I want to see or define as my success. So that's a perfect tip because I think people get a bit caught up in the shiny objects and I've got to do Instagram, but I've got to do Facebook, I've got to do offline, I've got to do online just because somebody else is doing it and they don't always start with a strategy. So I think that's um, a really great place to start. Yeah, definitely. And I think one of the misconceptions is exactly that, that because other people in your space or even people that you admire who aren't necessarily in your same industry are doing a lot of these things that are seemingly successful. So you might be on Facebook, for instance, and notice that one of your competitors or one of your friends who's an entrepreneur has been really successful with Instagram. So you suddenly feel drawn to that platform thinking, well, I'm decently successful on Facebook, but I really see their success on Instagram and feel like I can mimic that. So let me jump onto that platform. And then slowly they start to see, okay, if I want to keep up with Facebook and Instagram, and then I have all these other strategies working at the same time, I'm spreading myself really thin. And not only that, but they're not figuring out which platforms are really worth their time because they're delving little bits into this one and that one and the other one without taking the time to really see these platforms through fully and really take all of the bits and pieces and how usable they are to really boost their business results. Yes, that's so true. And what people tend to do is they don't think about where their audience is hanging out. So if they've got uh, an older audience and they're an early uptake to Snapchat, they probably didn't do overly well. Most of these programs, are, platforms, of course, grow over time, but certainly if you're an early adapter, you can um, end up spending a whole lot, heap of time where your audience actually isn't. Charlene Johnson says you should work it a season in each of your areas. So get to really know something before you move on to the next one. Right. I actually have a client. She tried to launch a Facebook group a couple of weeks ago and she went live in the Facebook group one time and she had a few people show up to her live. Not a lot, like two or three showed up and she messaged me and said, well, I started the group and I went live and two people showed up. And so, you know, I don't think that's working. What else can I do? And my immediate response was like, stick with this. You know, you have to commit to it. It's all about consistency and commitment. I have a business coach and she's brilliant. And one of the things she said to me the other day was you have to wake up every morning and treat your business like a marriage. You have to renew your vows to your business. So you wake up and say, today I commit to this business. I commit to making it work. And that sometimes means showing up to a live where no one is there. Sometimes that means showing up to a live every day for a month straight where no one shows up. And when you show up consistently, other people will show up and eventually it will become something. And obviously I tell people, you know, you have to define a breaking point, right? Like if you're going at this Facebook group for three to six months and no one's showing up, something's not working and you need to adjust or pick a different platform potentially. But if you're trying one live, if you're waiting two weeks 
and you're not seeing traction, that's normal. Like a lot of these strategies take time to grow and jumping from one to the next is not going to be the keys to your success. And that's also going to lead you to worry and doubt and fear results in your business, which is again, going to cause you to have scatterbrain and invest in way more things than you need to, and then overextend and burn out. Yes. And I guess the other thing with lives is people don't realize that it mightn't be a time frame that suits the person that wants to watch. So they may also come back later on and see it. So you might have only got two people live, but you actually got an audience of 10 or 15. And over time, that will grow. People tend to sort of get their marbles and throw it out and say, well, I didn't hit anything. So I'm going to pack them up and try something else. Definitely persistence. Yes. And metrics are important. Like you just mentioned, I had a training the other day and I had 88 people registered for the training and 26 showed up live. And I watched the video. I I left a replay there. I watched the video metrics. And over the course of 24 hours, I had 74 views. I went from 26 people live to 74 views. So almost all 88 people had viewed the video and it took a full 24 hours because of the time frame. So I think a lot of people need to give it that time and also to have people see that you are showing up consistently and it doesn't matter if people on that shows that you're committed. And that means that this topic is meaningful to you and that you have a lot to say about it. And that's going to inspire people to say, oh, well, they're showing up every single week. Maybe I should jump on one of these lives and see what it's all about. And that's going to really draw people in instead of you kind of showing up one week and then not showing up again for a month or, you know, just abandoning it all together. It's never going to gain traction or momentum. Yeah. And with our global society, people actually will register for things when they can't make it because of the time frame. So when yeah. you went live, it might have actually been a silly hour in the morning for whoever was watching. So they'll come back and watch it at a better time. Also, of course, people are busy. So even if you are in the same time frame, it may not have worked for them. People tend to register and then come back to those things later on when they do have time. Well, and not just the lives too. It's also, and this is something else that I tell people is, you can't put all of your eggs in one basket. Even though you're simplifying your business processes and the platforms that you're on and all of your systems, you still have to diversify your marketing strategy. I always say pick a couple of things. Like don't rely on your Facebook group. Don't rely on your live streams to get you clients to build traction in your business. You also have to create other spaces because not everybody enjoys the same mediums. So some people are visual learners. They really love to attend lives and view them. Other people really love to consume information that's written. So they'd prefer a blog post or an email campaign or something that you're sending them in Messenger. And then there's other people who really just want to get on the phone with you and have a one-to-one conversation. So allowing all these different personality types to engage with you in different ways will help you see, okay, what are the things that are bringing me the biggest ROI? And how can I repeat those strategies for my ideal client? And over time, you don't even have to have a niche in the beginning. All you really need is a plan for reaching people and visibility on the services that you love to provide that bring you joy. And then slowly over time, your audience will naturally define itself. And the ways that you contact people and the ways that you reach out to people that are the most successful will naturally define themselves as well. So people who start out doing lives might end up only doing blogs a year later because they find out that their ideal audience really prefers the written content. Or some people who blog today might end up transferring their blog into a vlog because they find that their audience ends up liking video content more. So it's really about testing and optimizing, but little bits at a time, not throwing everything in and just kind of seeing what I always say, throwing everything at the wall and seeing what sticks is never a good strategy. No, it's not. And I guess the other point there is if you are picking two or three different platforms, you can also repurpose that live. So if you start with a video and people actually like blogs, then you can have the transcript done and then whether you rewrite it or you get one of your team or send it off to be rewritten, then you can use that. Of course, you can then pull out the the important parts, that the quotes to then become a quote for Instagram or Facebook. Out of that one piece of content, you can spread it onto the three or four different areas that you are using. Absolutely. And just to get visibility on that, like the other day when I did my training, I sent out an email after 
with the link to watch the replay. So anyone who might have been bombarded in social media, who's got tons of notifications and lots of connections, they're always being invited to things. Sometimes it's easier for them to just like click to watch the replay from an email because they actually check their email. And other times I have clients who say, I never check my email because I get so many emails, but I'm always on social media. They were on the live when it happened and they're completely aware of that. But other people kind of need those gentle reminders in other ways. It's nice to be able to not only repurpose the content, but also figure out how can I get this in front of as many people as possible. And maybe that means something as simple as blasting it out to your social media audience in multiple platforms, sending out a quick email, and then also setting up a live event with reminders for people who register. Yeah. And as we all know, sometimes we've got great intentions to jump on that live or webinar and different things happen and we sleep in or we've got something else or somebody drops in. Yeah. Having that um, gentle reminder that it, it has happened. Here's the replay. And the other thing, of course, is sometimes the people that are on the live think that it's such good content. They want to go back and re-listen to a, a section. You can actually get to the same audience then getting more value. But again, once you've sent them out, a reminder notice. Yep, absolutely. And another strategy that I love for avoiding burnout when you're growing a business is to have your clients and your customers help you do the work. There's a lot of free advertisement in great referrals and in testimonials and social proof. And people who love what you do and follow the movement behind your brand and really believe in it just as much as you do, which is quite possible with many of your clients, that they're an untapped resource to advertise for you. And like the other day, I gave a free workbook out to part of my audience. And one of those people called me and said, I've been using this workbook and it was a game changer for me. And then she went on Facebook. I didn't ask her to do this. She went on Facebook and she gave me a five-star review on my business page and told people that the content that I gave her was simple, easy to follow and was changing her business. And it was remarkable because she's not even like really a client of mine. She's in my, she's a follower and she wants to be a client. And we've talked about that, but she also just to give me that free boost for other people to see that I'm doing something right. That's the biggest, you know, bang for your buck basically is to get people to speak to your value without you having to do it for yourself all the time. And when you have clients, when you have like my marketing consulting company that I started before growth mindset marketers, it's been around since 2015 and I've never marketed that business. I built that business completely on referrals. I made one cold call four and a half years ago and I converted that man's revenue from $3,000 to $70,000 a month within a three month time frame. He recommended me to several of his friends who were also entrepreneurs and it spiraled from there. And I have people coming to me still to this day that I say, I don't have the bandwidth to work with you. That's the power of a referral program that people just come to you. You never have to do anything. It's an inbound marketing strategy. And one of the favorite things that I do when I send out invoices, I remind them at the bottom of the invoice that I have a referral program and that their pricing would change from this to this with their referral discount on that invoice if they were to send someone my way. And it has changed multiple people's attitudes about referring people and more of them have done it because they see the savings that they could achieve. And that's one of my favorite tips to give. Lovely. That's a, a win-win. And of course, somebody else spruiking your business is so much more powerful than you spruiking your business. So if you've done a great job and people are doing that, I think sometimes you do need to ask. So even that just subtle on the, the bottom of an invoice, because not everybody realizes that the power that they have, if they just mention you to a business colleague or a neighbor, or depending on what kind of business you're in, a girlfriend. So yeah, it's definitely important to ask as well. Yeah, and that's a great way to phrase it because a lot of people forget that there's power in awareness and a lot of people assume, oh, everyone knows I have a referral program. It's on my website. I have a landing page dedicated to this, but they've never actually called their customers and spoken to them about the referral program or the benefits of it, or they've never mentioned it to them in passing, or they've never put something on an invoice for them to visualize what their discount would be as a referral partner. And so people kind of forget about it. It's not top of mind for them because 
they're just focused on their own business and their own growth. And so if you make it top of mind in a nice, gentle reminder type way, like, oh, I saw it on your website and it showed up on my invoice. And then I saw you did a post about it on social media the other day. It's constantly top of mind. And then when someone reaches out to them and says, hey, do you know anybody who does X, Y, or Z? They would immediately think like in my realm of business, oh, Justine is great at that and she has a great referral program. I'm going to mention her name before anyone else that I can think of because she's constantly telling me about it. And so I don't really have to do anything because it's a canned part of my invoices. It's part of my general like website and business strategy. And so people just come to me and it's just on automated, you know, repeat basically. Yeah, and I think that's definitely a thing too is that people don't realise how many touch points you need having those three or four. They think, oh, I'm being pushy. But it's just that top of mind, that reminder. So um, great strategy. Okay, so we've talked about simplifying your marketing. What else should we be looking at doing to increase our growth without burning out? I think one of the keys is really just bringing it into the realm of, okay, how can I be visible with my ideal audience? And how can I make as many offers to them as possible when it makes sense? Growing your business where you feel like, oh, I constantly have to reach out to people. This is especially the case on social media. A lot of my clients use social media to grow and they feel like I'm in all these Facebook groups and I'm in all these forums and I'm talking to people every day and I'm sending out 15, 30 friend requests and I'm doing all these things. And it's like, okay, but where is your audience spending time? To your point earlier, like, be where your audience is and be really visible and then add value to them as much as you can and make offers as appropriate. So people usually forget one of those three pieces. They're either super visible, not adding value, making offers, or they're not visible at all, but they're adding value to the wrong people and then they're making offers to the wrong people. Or they're super visible and they're adding value and they're neglecting to make the offers. Figuring out how do I connect these three pieces and make it work for me, that's really the key. Because even in my business, you know, I'm guilty of it too, right? Like sometimes I'll find myself adding tons of value to people and then I'll neglect to make an offer because I'm like, oh, they know what I do. They could come to me. But the truth is, just like the referral program, people need the awareness. They need the reminder. And it's not pushy. It's just making them aware. And you can do it in a way that feels good to everybody and makes sense. And almost to the point where, and this is something that I teach all of my community members, where you're not even selling, people are already sold by the time you make the offer because you've been so visible and so valuable that by the time you make the offer, it's just giving them a means to take action that they were already going to take as soon as they heard about it anyway. Yeah, it's an option to buy as opposed to selling. And I think to your point that generally, particularly in Australia, and I know the UK people are a bit guilty of it as well, we do get quite visible, add value, add value, add value, add value, and yeah, forget to ask for the solution that can solve their problem, make that offer major problem that people forget to say here I am I do actually have a solution for you I can help you and here's a way that you can work with me yes absolutely and another strategy that I absolutely love is content marketing a lot of people kind of think about email as a silo but I think about it as part of something that I like to call the value funnel where you start off by giving someone a great piece of content or engaging with them, getting them on your list, creating some sort of opt-in, and then nurturing that relationship from start to finish in a very automated but personalized way. Anything that you can do that's hands-off is automatically going to avoid burnout. The more that you can automate, but keep a little bit personalized to your audience, like making sure that you're using merge tags in your email campaigns to get their first name in there. Or I love to do like free trainings and ask a question like, what's your biggest struggle right now? And then using that as a merge field so that when I send them an email, I can segment my list by what their major problems are and cater my email campaigns to them so that they feel like they're getting their actual problems heard and addressed versus just sending some major blast email campaign. Um, On episode 45 of the Small Business Talk, we actually did how to make your marketing more human. And it was all about that, about making sure that you are using automation in the right way 
and that you are personalising it and not sending it to the inappropriate people or sending it to people after they've already opted in saying, please opt in, opt in, opt in. Automation is great, but you do need to do exactly what you were saying there is segment it and make sure that you're sending the right messages to the right people. Well, and one thing that I challenge people to do often is not to always have an offer in your emails. Sometimes I like to put it as a PS, or sometimes I like to just call them to an action that's not a purchase option. So like in a lot of my campaigns, I get, you know, 80 to 90% open rates and above 60% clicks on some of my emails. And those emails are usually the ones where they're driven by value and there's only an offer at the very end. So you're building up to that offer where throughout you're pointing them to resources, which are also great for building a business, right? Like it doesn't have to be the sale off the bat. You want to nurture those relationships. So you start off like someone downloaded my social media checklist. Now they have that. Now I'm giving them some tips for how to be more visual on social media. Then I'm sending them some common mistakes and how to overcome them in social media. And I'm pointing them to recent posts that I've done on Instagram and recent trainings I've done on Facebook so that they're engaging with me. They're liking my page. They're following me. And now they're becoming more of like invested in my brand as they go and they still haven't made a purchase, right? So they're engaging, they're liking my Facebook page, they're engaging, they're liking my Instagram. That's great for the algorithms. That's building my business too. And then slowly it comes to the point where I say, now you've got all these great tips. You've got a checklist, you've got tips, you've got mistakes and how to overcome them. Guess what? I teach even more of this stuff in my community. Here's the link if you want to become a part of that. And here's what that would look like for you. And really at that point, they've already seen all my Facebook content, all my Instagram content. They've attended things. They've used my workbooks. Now, by the time I make that offer, my conversion rate is over 30% because all those people already feel that value and are ready to make that purchase before I even say anything. And by the way, I haven't even done anything. This is all automated. Those posts were already there. Those emails were already being sent. I'm just sitting back and watching people sign up and become members without doing a thing besides creating my next funnel to get all those people in and invested and build my business more. And it goes back to your marriage analogy that that becomes your dating game. So you've met, you've had a couple of casual conversations by the water fountain or at the local shops or whatever. And now you've actually gone on a couple of dates and now they're they're ready to make a bit more of a commitment. So that's a a perfect way to do it. Okay, so we've talked about simplifying it. We've talked about talking to your audience in the way that they would like to be spoken to. Is there any final tips you think we should be looking at to avoid burnout? I think one of my favorite tips is figuring out how to be more productive for your personality. I love different methods of productivity, one of them being the Pomodoro method, which is basically working in very short bursts of time. So 25 minutes or so, and then a five minute break and batching my work. Like when I create social media posts, for instance, I do all of the writing for a week's worth of posts in a 25 minute time block. Then I take a five minute break and then I do all of the writing for the next week of posts. And then I take another break and I might do all of the design of those posts in another time block. And I work that way because my brain shifts and the energy that I'm using shifts in between design work and writing work because it's different parts of my brain to try to figure out, okay, so what can I do that's going to make me the most consistent. I don't have to switch screens. I don't have to change platforms from writing to designing to scheduling, use three different applications. I'm sitting down and just doing one task, really focused, hyper-focused, and getting way more done in a short amount of time. And then from there, I also love figuring out from my personality. Like when I wake up in the morning, that's when I'm the most creative. Before I have my coffee, when I just wake up, I love to journal and write down all of my thoughts that come to my mind like, okay, I could do this great idea. I have a really fun idea for this thing. And then I write all of those down in my notes. And then from like 10 to 2 in the morning, 
that's when I'm my most focused. So I love to do the Pomodoro method at that time and really hone in on, okay, let's write all these posts. Let's design all these things. Let's get everything scheduled. And then I know that in the middle of the day from like that one to three time frame is when I kind of have a lag and my energy levels are really low. So that's the time of day where I challenge myself to do something new or I reach out to someone like a mentor or a friend or a potential client to try to bring my energy levels back up by having conversations with other people that spark things in me to get it going again. And then I like to finish my day, you know, figuring out, okay, where do I need to go to achieve the rest of my goals for the day? Maybe that requires me to do some more work on content. Maybe that requires me to do some more scheduling, some more brainstorming, whatever it is. So really knowing where in the day you're the most creative, where in the day you're most focused and playing to your strengths and then also batching your work to use the energy and the focus that you have at different times of day and where you're performing best to do your best work. That's great advice because I think sometimes people jump around too much. I think this whole multitasking thing um, is going to make them more productive, but all it does is continually make your, your brain hurt because it's trying to switch between those platforms and those tasks. So setting them up in batches and sections works so much better for a lot of people and I love the idea of you've worked out what times of the day you you work best because I know some people do it really well in the morning other people do it mid-morning other people do it later in the evening so um, working to your strengths is wonderful. Oh, I was just going to recommend really quick. Gary Keller has a book called The One Thing, and it speaks to multitasking and how it's a myth. And it's a great book for anyone who's looking for a recommendation on professional and personal development. Yes, I I love that book. I read it a few years ago, and I um, do constantly go back to it. Every time I find myself slipping into multitasking or scatterbraining, I go, (laughs) right, go back, do the one thing, get your three things for the day. What are we going to start with? Yep. And I think that um, is definitely a, a way to move forward when people set their goals and then don't break them down. They disappear into the ether. But you set it, you work out what you need to do for your month, your week, your day, and then you can actually really achieve something. So this is great. This has been great, Justine. We're up to the final five. I ask all my guests five final questions. Are you game? Yeah, sure. What is the best advice you have received from a mentor? Oh, that's a good question. I would say to lean in to the feelings that you have about your business when you have them. If you're feeling fear in your business, instead of pushing it aside, sweeping it under the rug, or trying to push through it, lean into it. Allow yourself to feel those feelings understand where they come from so that you can solve them and actually move on in a way that allows you to overcome and persevere long term. So a lot of times people feel fear and they go, oh, I'm not supposed to have fear. I have to, you know, push through. I have to overcome. I have to fake it till I make it. But that's never the solution. The solution is always to if you're feeling excited about something, lean into that let yourself absorb that excitement and let it propel you forward. If you're feeling fear, lean into it. Let yourself understand, overcome and persevere from that. If you're feeling, you know, worry or doubt, I actually did in my group, I posted an image of an iceberg and underneath the iceberg was fear, doubt, worry, hard work, all these things that people are afraid of. And then at the very tip of the iceberg is success. And one of my clients said, I'm, you know, doubts abound today. I'm so doubtful in my business. And I said, look at how close doubt is to the surface of the water. You are so close from breaking through. Imagine if you just looked at this visual every day and you felt that fear and you felt that doubt and you watched it build and you leaned into it. And then finally you had your breakthrough and you achieved success like within the hour, within the day, within the week, what would that feel like? And she replied and said, I'm crying tears of joy because I feel so supported in that statement. And it makes me feel empowered to have doubt where before I was worried and I was scared and nervous and all these different emotions. But now I know that it's part of the process and it's okay to have these doubts and that I can learn from them and take away so much from that. And that was really powerful. Yes, definitely powerful. And maybe we can link to that graphic if you're okay with that. Yeah, it's not my graphic. I pulled it offline, but I can definitely share it with you. Perfect. And I like the acronym FEAR 
which is false evidence appearing to be real. Yes, I love that, yeah. It's a great one to keep in mind. What is the biggest help you have received since starting your business? Definitely coaching. When I started my consulting business in 2015, I made no money for the first three months. And I was very fearful in my business at that point because I had a newborn at home and bills to pay. And I was giving away a lot of value and I wasn't selling anything. And I had all these people telling me that what I was doing was great. And they were taking a lot of the principles and what I was giving them because I was oversharing and they were using them to grow their business without ever paying me for it. And then I invested in a coach and she pointed out things that I thought I already knew, but she really helped me to see. And immediately within that first month of working with her, I made my money back twice over. And since then, I've gone on to scale my business to five figure months. And now I have two businesses. And in my second business, I just launched in August Growth Mindset Marketers. And in this business, I just hired a coach. And I told her when I signed on with her, I don't need you. I want you because I believe in coaching and coaching is part of what I do. And after my first session with her, we ended the call. We were just about to end the call. And she said, do you have any any final thoughts? And I said, I want to retract my statement from earlier. I know that I said I didn't need you, but I need you. And she was like, I know. And it was just kind of a funny observation. Like, we all think that we know the best, especially when it's something that's close to home and what we do and what we're comfortable with. And I've been coaching and training for almost 12 years. And to know and realize like, wow, there's so many things that another person can see within myself that were there all along, but just unlocking that potential is so powerful. So definitely having a coach has been a game changer. Yes. And we get so close to our own stuff that we often can't see it. So having an outside perspective is a great idea. What's the one thing you have to do every day? Your non-negotiable? Gratitude. So every morning I wake up and I go to my gratitude. I also set my intentions for the day every single morning. So when I wake up immediately before I even open my eyes, as I'm waking up, I say out loud the things that I'm grateful for that day and the things that I want to accomplish in my mind. I just think of all the things. And then from there I get up and I usually, I mean, I would say probably another non-negotiable is my cup of coffee in the morning, but (laughs) sometimes it's tea. But I love to have that morning routine. And especially as a mom of two kids, waking up and having that time that's just for me to reflect, even if it's just for five minutes, brings me so much clarity and really sets me up for success every single day. Lovely. What is your favorite business book and why? Simon Sinek is my favorite author. I'm actually seeing him live in March. I just got tickets the other day. I'm very excited. But he has a book that's called Leaders Eat Last. And this book was supposed to be about leadership within companies and organizations. He has another he has a bunch of books and they're all wonderful. But this book specifically, I took so much more out of it than just the basic tenets of leadership. And it really was kind of the launch point in me starting Growth Mindset Marketers as a company and being able to see within myself all these qualities and understanding emotions and understanding chemical reactions within the brain and the body that really contribute to success. And he's just a beautiful writer and so inspirational. And there's a lot of little takeaways within that book that a lot of people I feel may overlook. And it's worth a read and a read again. And I actually, when I finished reading it, I ordered copies for every single one of my consulting clients and mailed them out as a random act of kindness type of gift because it was it was such a gift to me that I felt everyone needed to read this book. So that's an easy recommendation. Lovely. And people don't realize that there are more books by Simon apart from the why book. So um, that's great to remind people. Yep. Okay. And our last one is what do you wish you had known when you started your business? Probably that growing a business is easier and more fun than I thought it was. So when I started out, I was I felt like growing a business was really hard. And there's a lot about it that takes work. Like entrepreneurship is not for the faint hearted at all. It does take work. It does take a lot of effort and it requires a certain commitment and mindset that a regular nine to five corporate job doesn't require. But I think that, you know, going back to the earlier conversation of the fact that it's really more simple, if you break it down and figure out where your strengths lie and play to those strengths and do something that you love that brings you joy, 
then it's really fun and easy to grow a business when you come from a place of authenticity and happiness in what you do. And I always tell people, if you're in this for the money, you're in the wrong business. You need to be in it for the joy. Wake up every day, make it an easy yes to recommit to your business and your vision and your mission and your clients and all the people that you serve and come from that place of service and value before sales every single time. And the money will come. The money is a result. But the money is not the goal. The goal is to really wake up with purpose and be inspired and be able to share your gifts with the world. And you get to dictate how that looks. So if you love being on social media, your audience is probably there. Like Facebook has 2.4 billion active users every single day. If your audience isn't showing up on Facebook, I don't know. There's very few audiences that aren't there. So if you love Facebook, then do that. You know, everyone gets emails be on email. Like if that's something that you enjoy, you can make these things work for you to grow your business and you can really simplify and you don't have to do things that make you uncomfortable or don't align with who you want to be or what your brand represents. You can choose to do the actions that bring you joy and you can choose to provide the services or the or the products or do what you want to do and live that really fulfilled life every single day and make money doing it. And that's great, isn't it? When you can do what you want to do for joy, but actually feed your family and make money as well. So that's a perfect way to end our conversation, Justine. So if our SBT audience would like to know more about you, how can they find you? I'm on Facebook, Instagram, and I have my website. Everything is Growth Mindset Marketers. So at Growth Mindset Marketers on Instagram and Facebook. And my website is growthmindsetmarketers.com. Lovely. And we'll link to all of that in the show notes. So I appreciate your time and your wisdom. Thank you, Justine. Thank you so much. Have a great day. Don't forget to subscribe to Small Business Talk podcast and head on over to smallbusinesstalk.com.au forward slash downloads for all the show notes and links to this episode. Remember, to be great, you must start. Pick one tip from today's episode, take action and implement it. Let's meet again next week at the same time and place. Until then, take action and SBT community, enjoy your journey.